Hello everyone and welcome to today's class on disruptive businesses and digitalization. I hope you're doing very well. So if you look at the world as we know it over the last 10 to 20 years, uh, the business landscape has drastically changed and um, there have been a number of disruptive businesses. And what we mean by, you know, disruption is basically, you know, if there's a market, um, and in, in that market, an innovation comes in and that innovation helps create a new market and a value network, which eventually disrupts the existing market and value network. That is an example of a disruptive business. So it basically, it, we're talking about, a, you know, an innovation that really, in effect, changes the entire business landscape. And um, it just changes the whole network, the market as we know it. And so, um, you know, again, as I mentioned, if we look back last 10, 20 years, we can see a lot of changes. Let's go through a couple of them together. The world's most watched television channel, YouTube. Um, this was established in 2005, has about 2 billion uh, people visit it monthly. Biggest social club, Facebook established in 2004. World's biggest communication channel has now become WhatsApp. It was established in 2009, um, has about 1.6 billion active users. Biggest newspaper, Twitter, established in 2006. Um, biggest job professional club, LinkedIn, established in 2002. Biggest hotel is Airbnb, established in 2008. Biggest taxi company, Uber, established in 2009. World's biggest meeting room has uh, become Zoom, uh, which was established in 2013. And uh, its stock market price has absolutely uh, skyrocketed. So especially with all of the coronavirus um, issues that have been going on in the recent past, this crisis actually uh, you know, works favorably for this company. The world's biggest university, Udemy, um, this has now 50 million uh, students registered. Uh, this company was established in 2010. World's biggest shopping mall is Amazon. This, has been, this was established in 1994. It has 200 million shoppers. World's biggest cinema house is Netflix, established in 1997, um, 170 million viewers. World's biggest library has now become Google, established in 1998. It has um, 80.7 billion users. And the world's biggest post office has uh, become Gmail. Um, and this was established in 2004 and has 1.5 billion users. So as you can see, um, you know, these businesses came in and they completely disrupted the market. If you take, for example, Uber, um, they used an innovation, uh, they developed an app and they really changed the landscape of the whole, you know, taxi business or, and uh, it's affected the rent a car business as well. Um, similarly, you look at universities, um, online education, has taken, you know, has grown in leaps and bounds. Um, students are now many times preferring to study online as compared to go, going to a university. Um, you know, cinema houses, uh, you know, people used to go to cinema houses, now Netflix. You can watch, you know, um, best movies in the world in excellent quality on your, at sitting at home. And so long story short, um, these businesses came in and they have disrupted the market as we know it. And in the last 10 to 20 years, um, these businesses have grown global. So not only did they affect the markets in which they originated, they have affected the entire global business landscape. Um, so that's something very important to know. Another in important thing that is, um, you know, face, everybody's facing is the whole e-commerce business. And if you really think about it, the internet um, really began to be used by public in 1995. That's really when um, firms started using the internet. So really not that long ago. And, um, you know, it was 
soon after, you know, 1995 to 2000, where uh, firms began buying and selling, uh, sorry, uh, companies started post, you know, putting things on portals where customers could buy and, and sell goods. So um, eBay, for example, is a site where customers can sell their used goods or goods that they're not using. Um, Amazon is a place where you can buy um, goods from Alibaba again. Um, so a couple of years after Amazon uh, came into being, Alibaba also um, started, a, you know, a shopping um, site. And uh, both of these have become, you know, some of the largest uh, stores. And they really have beaten the traditional stores in a huge way by leaps and bounds. Um, another really big change that came about in the year 2000 to 2010 was that, you know, firms started reaching out to customers from multiple uh, channels. And so initially, you know, store uh, businesses used to have a store and that's how they used to reach out to their customers. They would send flyers, they would send ads and customers would go to the store. Well, nowadays there are many, many ways um, that uh, companies reach out to uh, their uh, consumers, um, their customers. Uh, it could be through multiple sites. It could be, um, you know, through um, sending text messages, WhatsApp messages, discount offers, all these different, you know, um, several different channels. And so not only are they communicating for advertisement, but also to sell goods. So there are many websites now, many companies have developed their own websites where, um, you know, clients can actually buy goods online. So again, there's just been a whole lot of changes. And um, many times companies now are hold, keeping uh, their traditional retail operations and they have e-commerce operations. One thing to note is that companies keep their e-commerce um, business and their distribution channels for e-commerce and forecasting and all of the supply chain for e-commerce separate from their traditional um, retail operations. And uh, the reason is that the, each uh, of these markets are have very different dynamics and need to be dealt completely independently and separately. Um, so even the, they will have separate warehouses, they may have a warehouse um, for their traditional business, but they'll have a fulfillment center for their e-commerce, which is a warehouse specifically meant for e-commerce goods. Um, and so everything is done completely separately. Nowadays, a lot of companies are known to have, uh, known as a bricks and clicks. So they have a you know, a mixed strategy. They have uh, retail operations, but they also have an online uh, presence as well. So they are doing e-commerce as well as um, selling traditional um, through their retail outlets. So um, now another big thing that really has was created a big boom in the e-commerce world was the introduction of the smartphones. And so in 2007, um, you know, the smartphone was introduced and Apple released the first iPhone smartphone in, on January 7th, 2007. And so um, this became, a, you know, a, a really big hit. And so as of 2016, 50% of the world's population now has smartphones and 40% uh, of the world's population has internet con connectivity. And so this really boosted the whole mobile commerce, also known as M commerce. And so a lot of people would just, you know, started buying um, things online from their mobile. Um, another big, um, you know, change or difference that has that came about in right around the year 2000 was the whole um, evolution of omni-channel, and this is basically multi-channel retailing. So. Um, you know, firms will offer options, many options to buy their goods on, you know, from different, from di in different ways. Um, so there are many online and offline channels where they can, um, you know, buy goods. Again, this whole omni-channel is basically reaching out to customers from different channels. So um, this, this whole ideology of you know, kind of reaching customers in very many different ways began right around the 2010 era. Um, era. 
And so this is again operations where, you know, uh, operations are mixed between channels. Consumers have multiple options for researching, ordering, receiving, paying, and or returning products. So again, um, offering so many different options, right? Um, so customers can, can you know, check online, they can order online, they can go into the store, they can, you know, use their cell phone to make the order, use an iPad to make an order, um, you know, go on their desktop. So there's just so many ways now that uh, consumers can place their orders. There are many ways that they can receive their goods. They can pick them up in stores. They can, um, they can be dropped off at drop locations where, sorry, pick up locations where they can go and pick up the goods that they have placed an order for. Um, they can also have goods shipped to them. Paying methods have changed. You can now pay via debit card, credit card, um, you know, in cash, if you go to the store, um, there are other sites such as PayPal. And so there's so many ways to, um, you know, make payments to companies and also returning products. So you can return products um, by shipping it back by mail. You can ask the company to come many times. Um, they have riders, they can pick it up from you um, um, or you can just drop it off in the store. So um, this whole idea of offering very many different channels for buying and um, returning um, is something that you know is known as omni-channel. And again, in 2010, this is really when um, it started growing in a big way. So if you really look at it from a consumer's perspective, things have really changed in a big way. Previously in many, you know, let's say about 30, 40 years ago, um, you know, traditionally, uh, if people wanted to buy something, they would go to a store to a big, maybe a mall or a shopping area, and they would research whatever is available in the market. Um, you know, once e-commerce came in, um, they could start going on various websites and checking. And now with M-commerce and Omnichannel, they have many, many ways. They can go online, they can go to, you know, um, websites that help them compare. Uh, for example, Amazon, they can type in a product's name and, you know, check uh, for all the competitor products. They can actually go to another, a mall as well, if they want to go and uh, physically look at uh, things and research and view their options and then make, make a selection. It's a similar situation for ordering. Again, um, can be done. It traditionally, was just done in the store. Then, you know, it was done via e-commerce e online. Now it can be done, you know, through omni channels. Receiving goods. Um, there, here in this situation, again, you can have goods. Um, if you want, you can go to the store, buy it. You receive the good immediately. Um, otherwise, you can place an order and it can be shipped to you directly or it, you know, it can be sent to certain pickup locations where things can be picked up. Payment methods, as I had mentioned, um, there are many different payment methods now. And returning goods, there are also very many ways now that um, customers can return goods. <clears throat> so all of this is very good, but from the manufacturer or retailer's point of view, um, this creates a lot more supply chain challenges because you have to manage a separate e-commerce business, separate, tradi separate traditional um, retail operations. And so you're constantly having to check, you know, the changing requirements of e-commerce versus retail and your workforce has to adapt very quickly to the changes that are, you know, according to the environment, what your competitors are doing. Um, systems need to constantly be changed. Inventory needs to be checked and, and you know, again, separately for e-commerce, separately for, um, you know, the retail operations. And um, you really need to make sure that, you know, if, for example, you're sending goods, it's not just enough that you send it. If you send goods and you ship something, you have to ensure that the customer actually receives it. And sometimes it's not that easy. You may drop something off and the customer may say they, they never received it. So there are many different, um, it's, 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 it's more complex than it looks. Um, and the complexity has been increasing a lot as the number of channels has been increasing. 
again, even the returns, um, there is a lot more, um, you know, this whole idea of returning goods has increased with the, with the increase in e-commerce. And again, this is something um, the reverse logistics needs to need to be handled. And that's, again, adding a different level of complexity. So uh, with all of these new disruptions that have been happening and all the, you know, definitely it's been good for business in many ways, but it has added a great deal of, of complexity for businesses um, as well. All right. Um, now, what has happened is uh, most of these new businesses uh, that have been successful, they basically um, found, used some sort of uh, new business model, some sort of innovation, they integrated innovation into their business model and they changed the entire game. Um, and so they became game changers and they basically figured out a way through using innovation um, to really increase, uh, so decrease their costs and in increase their cost efficiency by same thing, um, decreasing their cost, they, offer, they were able to offer some new service offerings that none of their competitors were able to offer. And effectively, they were able to change the way that businesses were being run. Now, a big, big uh, force in uh, you know, creating all of these disruptive businesses has been technology. And, you know, I have a whole lecture on new supply chain uh, technology that has come in. And if you look at a supply chain, a supply chain, you can, let's say, a more recent supply chain. There's just so many new, so much of, uh, of this technology that's being infused in supply chains. So um, this cost efficiency um, that has come into companies and has also really uh, it, it, it's partially because of a lot of technology that has come in. So the demand forecasting has improved um, by virtue of big data, for example. Um, drones are uh, potentially being used uh, and will be used in the future as well. But, you know, ERP systems are being used. Um, there are just so much of technology that has made the entire supply chain a lot more um, easier to track. There, it's increased the supply chain visibility overall, and it's just made operations more effective and efficient. Um, there are also, um, you know, chips such as RFIDs, smart objects. Um, so now you, you know, you can almost you can communicate with goods, right? And you can figure out exactly where things are. And so here you can see this gentleman over here. He has this whole. Uh, vision, right? It's it's a lot broader vision than people would have have had in the past. So again, you know, I'm not going to go in a lot of detail uh, with a lot of these um, different technologies because I've spoken um, about them in another lecture, um, you know, uh, in great depth. But um, you know, all of these technologies have really, um, you know, catapulted and pushed businesses. Um, and to, to, to become more innovative. And uh, many of them have therefore uh, become disruptive businesses and um, they've really changed the business landscape. Another thing that has been happening over the last you know, 20, 30 years is a lot of integration. And so some companies have become bigger and bigger. They have um, either they've been going through vertical integration or horizontal integration. And um, this because of this, um, some businesses have become a lot bigger than others. So um, if you really want to think about horizontal um, integration. Horizontal integration basically means that you buy out competing uh, your competitors. So you buy competing companies in the same industry and so you just become bigger and bigger. And you know, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, there's been a lot of horizontal integration over the last 20, 30 years where big companies went out and bought out a lot of the smaller companies and they just became huge, very, very big. Some companies have also been um, involved in doing a lot of vertical integration, and this basically means the purchase of companies at all levels of production. So, um, you know, they go back, everything in the supply chain backwards, they kind of integrate. For example, you know, if this is, a, you know, this is somebody, a meat industry, they will go ahead and they'll, they'll kind of buy delivery wagons, meat 
everything related to their business, they'll go ahead and buy all of those things out. The warehouses, um, the refrigerated railroad tracks, the slaughterhouse, the cattle. So they'll just kind of buy out everything so that they are vertically integrating. They're basically buying out pretty much all the various um, companies that were they were working with previously in their supply chain and so they become a lot more you know um, well integrated they integrate all of this within the company and so they become in in a certain way they're they're relying a lot less on outsiders so you'll you'll see a whole lot of companies um, doing either vertical integration or horizontal integration and so the big companies have become a lot bigger and so small companies kind of have to work a lot harder or come up with some really innovative ideas to um, to compete in the marketplace. Also another big change that has happened is that um, there have become a lot of digital platforms that are being used for trading um, and so basically a platform is a place where groups meet to trade or otherwise transact in ways that would be difficult without the mediating hand of the platform. And so you will be solving a problem. Um, so you're on, you know, there nowadays there are big platforms for, you know, high level transactions. Entire stock markets have now been taken online for, you know, and their digital platforms have, that have been used. The restaurant industry has changed. Um, there are big, um, you know, platforms such as Food Panda that have been developed where, you know, all the restaurants are on Food Panda in Pakistan and you can, um, just kind of order um, from any restaurant and, and have food delivered to you. So there's been a lot more of these digital platforms coming, um, you know, evolving and, um, come, you know, and for example, um, YouTube is another big digital platform, right? For So anybody can charge, start a YouTube channel and um, basically post videos and other people can come and have a look at those videos. So um, these are just examples of, of huge digital platforms. And this has been another big trend um, as far as di disruptive businesses go. So if we really think about, you know, certain characteristics that disruptive businesses have, there are a few. Um, the first one is businesses, usually disruptive businesses, they start very small. They start as an experiment and um, they really focus on getting their process right. So, um, you know, and once they get their process right on a small scale, this usually does take time, by the way. Um, then they eventually grow on, on, on a larger scale. So um, you'll see a lot of startups and um, usually the startups, you know, they'll, they'll have their head down for the first couple of years trying to figure out their processes. Um, and usually um, the competitors don't really take startups that serious um, because, you know, they feel that, look, they're really small fish. But eventually, all of a sudden, sometimes um, their ideas and their methodology and their processes are are you know, strong enough to really give even the strongest uh, competitors uh, a hard time. Also, disruptors uh, build models that are very different from their competitors. One of the things that has been happening, um, companies that have been successful are innovators. They are not followers. Um, especially if you look at the company of iPhone, you see that um, Steve Jobs, for example, he really disrupted the entire world um, through, um, you know, new new innovations such as the iPod, um, the smartphones, and so the whole idea of you know developing apps, uh, for example, for music, and um, and so you know he. In effect, um, you know, the, the whole idea is if you want to really do well and be a disruptive business in today's day and age, it's really not enough to just copy people. Um, that's really not going to get you the results. Um, it's, it's the people, it's the business leaders that have the ability to think differently and, uh, you know, take calculated risks and really move forward with their ideas, start small experiment and then move bigger those are the ones that have been seeing a lot of success um and they're all right so um generally speaking startups they uh you know recognize an opportunity 
and they create usually an offering that appeals to most users because it's simpler, easier to use and costs less. So um, this is the winning uh, kind of combination that consumers are looking for. Um, you know, something that's simple, easy to use, and it costs very little. And um, again, if you think about, for example, YouTube, free to join. Uh, Facebook, you know, you can start a small business on Facebook, free to join. Um, so it costs very little, it's simple to use, and it's easy. And that's basically the companies that can build models that have these three elements have been the ones that have been doing extremely well. Um, so what happens is, you know, if such, such you know, in a, such uh, models are introduced by businesses, basic and average users usually switch to the new offering. And eventually these uh, become, you know, highly successful and they gain market share. Um, I have, you know, in the beginning of this lecture, I've spoken a little bit about, you know, some of the big disruptions that have happened in, over the last decade, um, couple of decades, and there were there have been many. But um, on the next couple of slides, you know, I have um, certain information um, on WhatsApp and on Uber and Airbnb and Amazon, and so um, you know, I I will be sharing these. Um, uh, slides with you as well. And um, again, if you know you want to learn a little bit more about each one of these businesses and their genesis, you can definitely um, read a little bit more about them and uh, familiarize yourself with them. Um, and you know, I've also included a couple of slides on how these businesses have actually started. And again, these businesses, um, surprisingly, almost all of these businesses started very, very small from very humble beginnings. And um, it was based on their business model, um, on their ideas, on their processes, and the value that they brought to the market. Uh, those were the those were the key factors that helped propel them into the immense success that they have seen. So um, for, feel free to you know go ahead and spend a little bit of time to learn more about you know how these businesses grew. Again, their stories um, uh, you know they, they started as startups, and many of these has have grown. Um, you know, in the beginning of this lecture, I showed you the level at which they've grown. So they've grown into these huge mammoth organizations and they're doing extremely well. Um, at the end of this lecture, I've basically picked uh, one story to share with you. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you you know, I've added a couple of slides. I, you can definitely go ahead and read more about the other ones, but I'll tell you just a little bit about one story and that's the story of Amazon. Um, and, and for those of you who don't know, Amazon is a site, it's, um, you know, kind of like daraz.com uh, or daraz.pk here in Pakistan, where it's an online uh, site where you can go and buy goods. So today, um, Amazon is the largest online retailer in the world. It was started by Jeff uh, Bezos in 1994 in Washington. And... Um, Today, it is the biggest retailer in the United States and the world's fourth most valuable company. And so what happened was back in 1994, uh, Jeff read a report about the future of the internet. And, and you know, according to the, uh, the report, they were projecting a growth in the e-commerce or web commerce business of about 2,300%. And so um, Mr. Bezos thought that, you know, it would be smart to sort of um, experiment and try to get, you know, benefit from this web e-commerce business. And so he created a list of 20 products that he could potentially sell online. And uh, then he, you know, narrowed those, that huge list down to five most promising products. And that included compact discs, computer hardware, computer software, videos, and books. And so he started off with books. And so he made a deal with a company by the name of Ingram. And he basically told them that he would buy books um, in a large quantity wholesale, and then he would sell them online on his, you know, his company's platform called Amazon. And so uh, the books that were being offered online were obviously cheaper than the books that were being that, you know, consumers would go to a retail store to buy. 
So um, seemed like a pretty good business, but Amazon actually, you know, had a slow start. And so, um, you know, first couple of years, really, they didn't really make much profit. Um, and then, you know, <clears throat> after the first couple of years, there was a dot-com bu bubble burst. And so basically there was a decrease in the value of a lot of the um, online businesses and they weren't really doing very well. And uh, many businesses, many e-commerce businesses went bust and so they just couldn't survive. Um, Amazon continued to survive, but, um, you know, in and, you know, finally in, it, in about five years time in 1999, it was, uh, you know, started getting some recognition as a good online shopping website. And um, it took seven years for this company to become profitable. In 2001, it became profitable. Um, later, slowly, what happened is that, um, you know, they, the, the business model changed and um, many third party sellers were allowed to sell their products on Amazon. And um, 1.3 million third party sellers began selling their goods on the website in 2007. And so what happened also was that for everything that was being sold on the website, customers were allowed to go in and write their customer reviews. And this became a very big part of their success story because um, it really helped consumers filter out which products they wanted to buy based on the customer reviews. And, um, and then after that, you know, Amazon started continuing to increase um, its, its uh, products range and it just became extremely successful. It has been continuing to be successful. Today, Amazon owns its own fleet of trucks. It has robot powered warehouses. It has owns 40 different planes. Um, it has um, uh, Uber like crowdsource delivery service. It's working on adding overall capacity and efficiency. Its future plans includes using drones and robots and um, it also has some features such as Amazon Prime, which makes customer delivery free if you pay a certain fee monthly. So um, that's just a story that I wanted to share with you about Amazon, which has definitely been one of the disruptive businesses. Again, um, you can see that it was just a, you know somebody who came up with a good idea, um, stuck with it, and eventually it became a business that has become one of the most successful businesses in the world. And then, and with that, I come to an end uh, to disruptive businesses. Uh, one of the things that it's very important, I would like all of you to take away is that e-commerce um, and all these digital innovations that have come out, um, these have helped businesses to become more lean and reduce the wastage. And so um, as far as Lean Six Sigma and, you know, all of these disruptive businesses definitely uh, fall in the category of using the lean principles of reducing um, uh, waste and through the reduced waste they actually reduce their they are able to reduce their cost and um, you know give good prices to their to the consumers and that's effectively how they um, have continued to be very successful I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I hope you learned uh, some new things Thank you very much and I look forward to having an interesting discussion on this topic with you soon.